Hello and welcome to Access Chat. Uh, today I'm dialing in from Argentina where I'm at the Global Disability Summit. Um, yes, you can call me a show off. Um, so i um, delighted to welcome Juliet Burton who I met at another conference. Um, Juliet was speaking at the BDF annual conference and um, I was um, most amused and also impressed by the, um, the humor and the content and the, the ability that you have to essentially um, bring levity to something that is uh, quite often very serious subjects and, and I think humor is a great icebreaker so um, can you tell us a little bit about you, you know how you got into comedy and, and everything else and, and, and the sort of topics that you talk about? Oh, absolutely um, I'm, I completely agree with you and what you say that, that comedy for me I feel passionately about it because um, laughing together it helps us feel less alone about no matter what we're laughing about um, and for me, it's it's a way of finding light in the darkness. So um, being funny about my uh, mental illness and mental mental health conditions um, is a way of surviving them. Um, because if we're if we're finding the funny within them, if the butt of the joke is either my conditions or the stigma that surrounds my conditions, the stigma that I encounter, um, then it's a way of uh, defusing situation, it's a way of breaking the tension. And um, for me, like performing comedy to uh, audiences that maybe have no experience of mental illness um, is equally as important as performing comedy to people who have experience of mental illness and need to know they're not alone. Um, and it's a way of, um, of making it more accessible, breaking down barriers, increasing understanding, um, and in a way that's fun and informative and entertaining. Um, but it's also um, important, I feel, that uh, you make the distinction between somebody who is uh, creating comedy through lived experience um, and therefore they have an informed uh, an opinion, they have uh, an informed perspective, they are accountable for what they're saying um, and their intention is always um, to, to help people understand where they're coming from. Um, I mean, you could ask how I got into comedy. And I used to be a journalist, so I used to um, work in magazines and newspapers. And um, whilst I loved that, it was all about communication for me. And um, when the recession hit, uh, I found it harder to get uh, work as a journalist and uh, started doing more voiceover work because I worked for BBC Radio. Um, that led me to doing more writing, which led me to do uh, more comedy. Um, and I very quickly realised that if I wanted to make people listen about the harder topics, like my more dark experience of mental health, I mean, I use the word dark, but perhaps difficult to understand, um, less common experiences, um, that which I'm sure we'll come on to. Uh, if I wanted them to listen, then if I was making them laugh at the same time as telling them about what was going on for me, then they would be more likely to listen for longer. Um, so it, it's a way of making it more accessible. Um, and also, for me, the more I've performed, uh, the more I hear other people's stories after my shows, and that it has absolutely helped me double down on this decision with uh, comedy being my my ultimate ambition, my ultimate aim. Um, I love making people laugh. Moreover, I love helping people feel like they're not alone. Um, and there's so many people who have amazing stories that I've heard over the years around the world. I've performed in Australia, New Zealand, um, all over the UK. Um, and yeah, it's it's kind of beautiful that I keep hearing such similar stories um, thousands of miles apart from each other and, um, and, and seeing people connect on social media as well through coming to my shows that might not live anywhere near each other um, and that's the glory of something like the Edinburgh Fringe Festival but, which is the biggest arts festival in the world um, you get audiences from all over the globe coming to your shows and yeah it's it's a real community. Comedy is a community, and I think when it comes to mental illness, community can be a lifesaver. Well said, and I, I think that um, you know, we're trying to foster a community here on, on social media through what we're doing with, with Access Chat, um, and sometimes we get a bit serious. And um, to be honest, I'm not that serious a person. I, I like to make the, the, the humour. Um, maybe all, always at inappropriate times, but then that's partly the neurodiversity kicking in, I think. Well, I think so, comedy, uh, comedy's meant to tread that boundary, though. It's meant to tread the yes. boundary between what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, and we're always, we're kind of the, the guards um, 
of of society of trying to test the water of what's okay to say and what's not not okay. So, yeah. yeah, no, uh, I, I agree, but I found myself working in HR and, and wearing a suit. And, and, and so sometimes, um, yes, I, uh, my, my close to the knuckle sense of humor can, <laughs> can I, I can sort of afterwards think, oh, really, I should have just kept my mouth <laughs> shut at that point. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep my mouth shut for most of the rest of this interview because I, um, I can't really see what's going on very well. Um, but, so forgive me if I jump in because I get excited, but um, I, I know someone out there has questions and comments and so uh, I'll, I'll hand over. And I'll I'll take it, but I I I like um, I agree. I think humor humor humanizes us, and so I love that you're doing it this way. And there's so many misunderstandings about mental health and mental mil, mental illnesses. And I I was talking to um, a big corporation the other day, and we were we were talking about this topic, and they said many of our creatives that work for us, we um, we have um, a lot of them actually that have bipolar, and they said you know bipolar has been so misunderstood in societies, and we've we've seen people with bipolars you know go crazy on television, and you know and it, we we've seen some real dark sides using your word. Um, related to bipolar, but actually people with bipolar are very creative and very artistic and they're very innovative in the way they think. And there's the, and I struggle myself with um, mental health problems with severe depression. And it's, and, and I, I, once again, I appreciate the word dark because sometimes it feels like I'm going into a dark hole and I'm doing everything I can to try to stay out of there and and you know eat right and you know all the things and then of course when life throws stuff at you my husband's walking a very very serious path with dementia my daughter with down syndrome got very very ill so you have all these things being thrown at you and you're sometimes finding the humor in it is is the best way to survive it and and juliet i know before we started recording you talked about the amazing pictures behind you and I was just hoping maybe you would explain on air what you explained to us before the show started, because I just think it really captures what we're doing here. And, and I love that you made the courageous decision to talk about your life and your work through comedy. I, I just think that's really brilliant. And I really applaud you, the, applaud the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, do you want me to tell you about the, the paintings or the show or which we go? Yes. Through? Well, I, I think you should, if you don't mind. Yeah, both, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, well, I'll come to the paintings in a second because uh, they're right there, like two guards behind me. Um, well, the, the, I've done quite a few different shows um, over the years. Um, I've sold out at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival for the last four years in a row. Um, and uh, I'm going back there again with a new show this year. Uh, so tickets are on sale now if anyone wants to come. Um, and yeah, I've, uh, I've done lots of different shows that always at some point talk about my either current experience or history with mental illness um, because it's a part of who I am. I am who I am um, in spite of and because of uh, my conditions. And uh, the show that I've just finished a national tour of, um, it's my first proper Arts Council funded um, national tour, um, it was called Butterfly Effect and it was all about whether kindness can change the world. Um, so I, a couple of years ago, I had a really difficult year and my therapist kept telling me to be kind to myself and I kept thinking I've got no idea how to do that um, so instead I focused on trying to do small acts of kindness for other people and kind of charted this quest of um, if you focus on kindness then can you find more kindness and um, it was really to celebrate um, a, a couple of um, experiences one, one of which was that there was a guy that I was flyered up in Edinburgh um, back in 2012 who came to see the show the next day and then came to see my following show the following year and when I fly other people I like to chat to them I like to get to know them I like to recommend restaurants and other shows and um, he said that the day that I flyered him he had actually been planning on committing suicide and um, the way that I chatted to him that day, he said in his words, felt like it was the first act of kindness that anyone had shown him in a really long time. He'd been battling cancer. He'd been going through a messy divorce. He was convinced he was going to lose his children. And 
he said in his words he then felt obligated to come see the show because i've been so kind to him that's that's how i get them i guilt trip them into it and uh, he then said that he found the show so uplifting that he changed his mind about his decision um and he still comes to the edinburgh fringe every year he's coming again this year he came to see me perform in australia um where he met a new woman he's still battling his health he's he's winning and living an amazing life and that inspired me to write this show um and for me kindness has helped me uh, a lot with my mental health um i have been a size four and a size 20 uh, due to eating disorders so i went from one to the other in around six months um i was first diagnosed with anorexia when i was 14 but before that had already um, i can look back retrospectively and say that i very confidently i, I had uh, symptoms of childhood anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, um, very like I bipolar was diagnosed when I was in my teens. Um, but uh, because it went undiagnosed, with, um, I had food issues as well um, around the age of seven or eight, so very early, but it was all you know back in the day when therapy wasn't the dumb thing. Um, so it then led to anorexia. Anorexia then um, led to me being sectioned under the Mental Health Act when I was 17. So I spent my 18th birthday um, sectioned under the Mental Health Act in hospital. And um, I had a hallucinations whilst I was there due to um, a stress-induced psychosis. So the stress of being sectioned and not knowing what was going on. Um, naturally, my brain, uh, I, I had uh, audible and visual hallucinations for about a period of uh, two to three months. Um, and uh, I then after that, about a year later, went from a size four to a size 20 due to compulsive overeating disorder. Um, was very suicidal because of that, um, because throughout my teenage years, I'd identified as an anorexic, you know, at a time when nobody really knows who they are and you're still figuring that out. Um, the one thing I knew I was was anorexic because I'd been told that I was. Uh, so I'd somehow lost my sense of I, I, sense of identity because i mean that's part of the illness is it tells you that that's who you are and um gives you a false sense of um, achievement um and then i uh, i then struggled with bulimia for the um, best part of a decade um and i still struggle with um all of those different voices in my head i have a little i like to think of them as um i say that that's different from audible hallucinations but these little cast of characters in my, in my head that my addiction, my anorexia mimic minx, um, and they're all still there every day. Um, I have anxiety disorder symptoms still regularly and obsessive compulsive disorder symptoms regularly, and I'm still in therapy. Um, but this has all informed every show that I, I do. Uh, the new show that I'm doing is uh, called Defined, and it's about how we define ourselves. And it's uh, exploring the difference between uh, the fake online perfection profile that we might put ourselves out there as um, either on Instagram or Facebook or for me more recently on dating apps which has been so much fun um, but I've kind of uh, enjoyed uh, in a very strange way enjoyed the experience of, uh, of putting my imperfections right out there and saying I mean what might be seen as imperfect but actually for me they're things that really the most beautiful aspects of myself like being sectioned under the Mental Health Act. If a guy on a date can't handle a woman who's been sectioned under the Mental Health Act, then he can jog on because uh, he's missing out on an amazing story. Um, but yeah, there's I'm kind of exploring the uh, the difference between what we put out there um, publicly and what we what we keep for ourselves. And um, actually, real world human connection is something that I think you can get on social media. But I think it's a, social media can be a bridge to making those real proper human connections so um that's going to be the kind of the thing for me with my shows and my audiences is that i've got a whole bunch of brand new friends right in front of me and they make it all worthwhile they're incredible and i would love for them to turn around and look at these other people around them and go i've got a whole new potential family around me right now if we just connect a little bit more so uh that leads me to the pictures behind me. Um, so yes, my pictures, um, I was on tour with Butterfly Effect, the show about kindness and whether it can change the world. I won a couple of awards and stuff and uh, did really well. Um, it's, uh, it led me to perform in Bristol, which is where these paintings are from. Uh, one of my shows was in an art gallery um, and it, all the art at the gallery um, during that exhibition had been created by 
mental health patients, um, inpatients and outpatients. And these three uh, behind me, if you can see all three of them, uh, were created by mental health patients. Sadly, I don't know their names, uh, but I do know the process that, through which they were created. Um, and having, I've been an inpatient myself five different times at five different uh, hospitals, clinics, NHS, um, and otherwise uh, across the country. Um, uh, it kind of replaced my education in some ways. In, in some ways, I think actually the stuff I learned in those clinics and in therapy has been as important, if not more important, than the stuff that I might have learned at school. Um, but uh, these paintings, um, so the gallery owner explained to me that uh, the patients were able to select the colours that they used and they kind of layered them up in, in a jar, in a kind of receptacle. Um, so the paints were layered up in these different colour orders so they could choose the colours and the order within which they layered them. Then they stood out uh, in this courtyard with these huge canvases um, and chucked the paints uh, across the canvases uh, and the way that it all lands uh, the way that it's uh, it dries is all down to the weather uh, the wind the sun the rain um, the trajectory um, and the lesson the holistic lesson was that we can control some aspects of our lives and we can control ourselves we we are in charge we can change ourselves but we have to let go and allow uh, external influences to affect things sometimes and know that that's okay it will still be beautiful in the end um so i i got these in september on tour um during a time that was really difficult for me um last year a lot changed in my life uh my um my relationship of seven years ended um we were meant to get married last year decided to break up instead which actually is so much better for both of us um and yeah there's been family illnesses and um uh, a friend unfortunately passed away and then my therapist passed away <laughs> um but uh what doesn't uh, break you uh, does make you stronger and um everything in my life all being sectioned all of the inpatient stuff all the therapy all of the difficulties last year um it's it's made me stronger i know i have fortitude and i can get through anything and if i can say that then anyone can wow <laughs> i think we all stand a little bit silent just continue to listen <laughs> well, i did talk for a really, really long no, time there no, is that our time amazing no, it's amazing, yeah. <laughs> amazing. That's super. That's why I invited you on because I, I, you know, I knew about the story and it's it's fantastic. And I think our audience are going to, you know, really you know, connect with this. Because I, I, I was I was um, listening to what you're saying and and also looking at the way how you, uh, how you collect stories and bring something to your uh, to to your own gigs, and this, this is a kind of a. Let's let's see if I put it in the right way. A kind of a social sociological storytelling, you know, uh, grabbing those you no know, things and then bringing them to your to your stories and bringing them on on, on stage. And somehow you know we're not uh, even if it is not something that this is not really what we call a deep sociological study. It brings a lot of the deep of the individual stories. Uh, that people relate. So I think it, it can be uh, something really, really uh, powerful that that people can actually can really relate with what you are, what you are seeing on stage. Thank you. I think I think it's important. Stories are vital, and the number of stories I've heard um, through doing shows um, and also through the mental health treatments that I've had, stories keep us buoyant they we learn from stories um and myths are built to teach us lessons and they're like therapy really myths and mythology um and uh, for me comedy is an extension of that um comedy is not therapy that's something that i keep getting asked to still get asked in interviews all the time uh, i don't ever talk about something on stage that i haven't yet dealt with in therapy um therapy is therapy comedy is comedy um, unless my audiences aren't laughing in which case i will call it therapy um they they usually do laugh they're lovely um i i think it's really important to use creativity because uh, for me, it's it's a natural way of coping with day-to-day -day life. Um, 
so whether that's writing it down just in a, as a diary, a lot of people um, use diaries. I often use my notepad just to write down um, any thoughts, whether they be poignant or funny. Uh, but it's the funny ones that I want to hold on to because having had so much serious stuff happen in my life, I'm kind of done with that. I need to focus on the fun um, and that's the beauty. You can't appreciate the sun without having some rain. And for me, if I if I nurture the com comedy and the, that 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 part of me that wants to seek out the fun uh then it helps me survive the rest of it so it's a natural a natural inclination so uh, uh so uh, is there anything that you can tell us in the way you about your creative process the way how you know you you look at you talk with people you uh, you search for stories but then how you build the stories in the continuum that like you like you did with the with the, with the with butterfly how you can how you create that continue that allows you to put kind of kind of a storyline that makes uh, uh, sense Sure. Um, I mean, I with my previous shows, what I've done is I've kind of applied journalistic uh, uh, ideology to it. So I do a lot of research around whatever topic it is that I want to talk about. So uh, my first uh, solo show was about careers, and I went on a quest to try to realise all my childhood dreams. But that was a way of me um, also telling the story of how hard I found it growing up. Um, the second show that I did was called Look At Me, and that was the first show that sold out and uh, won, won an award. Uh, and first show that went, oh no, the second show that went to Australia. Um, but that one was about uh, appearances and whether um, our appearances are who we are. Because having been the same girl in so very many different bodies in, in real life due to eating disorders, um, I wanted to see whether I could find confidence within a different body. So I got an Arts Council grant to mean that I could use prosthetic makeup to change the way that I looked in even more dramatic ways. So I spent a day being uh, a 90 year old lady or at least appearing to be a 90 year old lady, uh, a day uh, inhabiting a, a seemingly male body, um, a day wearing the hijab, uh, a day dressing quite provocatively and a day uh, revisiting my obese self because I wanted to try to find confidence um, and we filmed it with hidden cameras. So with all of those, I um, and my I did a show about decision making as well, about whether our decisions affect who we are and whether one decision really can change a life. With all of those, I interviewed lots of people about um, about their experiences regarding that topic. Uh, so, for the example, the appearances show, I interviewed lots of models and um, people with facial disfigurements or physical disabilities, um, which is how I have met, met most friends pool of interviewees, interestingly. Um, then more recently with things like um, The Kindness Show uh, and my current show, I've been connecting with people on Twitter a lot. So my research has been uh, through Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and asking, inviting people to be a part of my research through social media. Um, I like to collate all of that and um, think about the show a lot. I like to take a long time over my writing process. Um, but then in terms of structuring it, uh, I tend to like to think of it in a classic kind of storytelling narrative of um, setting out some uh, some quest element at the beginning and then going off on the story. Um, but ultimately, it's following the funny, and no matter what, it has to be the funniest outcome possible. So, uh, whatever jokes that are that are both truthful, my shows are always very very honest and very truthful, um, but also have the desired effect of making my audiences and myself. Laugh. Off, uh, then that's that's following the funny, finding the funny um, is what stays at the root, especially of my more recent shows. Um, and the rest of the creative process is actually the most vital part of it is being in front of an audience. So, um, for example, on, on tour, I started workshopping into the, the past show, the Butterfly Effect kindness show uh, new material that has now become a kind of staple material that will then be the bedrock of my next show um the one that's going to be uh performed this summer previewing the summer and then premiering it at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival um and yeah the getting it out there in front of audiences is the only way where it's a living breathing creative art comedy like it's it's both performance but it's also connection and it's it, it is reportage and it's it's honest um and it's research for me but then it's also just fun 
um, and you can only have fun when you're actually up performing and it kind of zinging around the room between you and the audience and you responding to what's happening in the moment. So it's it's almost like a mindfulness thing of making sure that you're present and in in, in the room with those people who are listening to you and responding to how, how they're responding. No, I, I have a friend in Australia, his name is Paul Colmar, and he works in technology, but sometimes after work or during the weekends, he does stand-up comedy. He's not, he's not a professional, but he likes to do it. Uh, what did you find new about yourself when you started? Is there something that you can tell us? What did I find uh, out about myself? Um... I, I mean, I when I first started performing, um, I I realised that my nervousness, my anxiety disorder, um, would often get in between me and the audience, um, and they would, they would think that that anxiety, that anxiety was because of my lack of confidence in myself, which is not the case. <laughs> uh, I have I have quite a great deal of confidence in my ability and in my my material. Um, but it's taken a lot to get to a point where I'm like, I, I can stand on stage and be, uh, give that, uh, that appearance of, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge, don't worry, we're, we're good here, but we're okay. Um, I also realised, uh, I learned about myself that um, for me, I, st I like it when my comedy's truthful. Like I, I know quite a few comedians who uh, kind of tell white lies or stories just just for the funny but for me reality is the most hilarious thing possible so um yeah i i've i think i've i've also learned that connection connecting with an audience and finding like they're my family i, I love i love my actual blood family but they don't come to my shows um i found my family that i made for myself through doing comedy um there's so many people out there who they kind of get to know you in a in quite an intimate way. <laughs> uh, they get to know a certain aspect of you on stage, but then the people who become your little pocket family, so your social media connecting family, um, they're there. Like when I was on tour, if I had a day when I was really struggling with my depression, I'm thinking of one specific day uh, that I, I tweeted um, and Facebooked and Instagram and just said, honestly, I'm really struggling. Um, anyone out there just, get in touch and I was overwhelmed with the amazing response from people um, that's what I mean when I said comedy is a community um, not only for the performers backstage but um, moreover for me it's about the audiences um, and I think audiences being at the center of everything I do like it's all for them um, yeah I, I, I'm really looking forward to Edinburgh this year just to hang out with my family again <laughs> that's a lot of information that's okay. great. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's great information. Go ahead, Neil. Um, well, I mean, I think to, you know, obviously encourage people to go and see the show because I'm the only one that's had the privilege so far. Uh, if you can send us the links to the videos of your stuff that you were doing before with the, the dressing up, because I've seen that and I think we'd love to share that because um, I think that, that that's great. You know, the, I particularly Thanks. like the granny dancing. They well, they're out. Um, I have trailers on YouTube that are yeah. available publicly. Perfect. Um, so right. if you if you wanted to check them out, then there'll be a new trailer that's about to be launched. In fact, I just got sent the final version uh, just before I came to chat to you guys. So that'll be um, for the new show. Uh, that's I'm quite excited by. It's quite fun. No, uh, fantastic. If, yeah. If 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 they are around uh, two minutes or around that time. I think it will be interesting to share them on, on directly on, on Twitter uh, to, to, to promote the Twitter chat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the new trailer should be ready. Um, that would be the one that I would, I would recommend uh, sharing the most. Um, I, think, I think you will like it. I know it's not what you've seen, Neil, uh, yet. But, uh, no, that's I, cool. <laughs> it's, it's, it's got a new aspect to it that I think you'll appreciate. Fantastic. I mean, it's exciting. No, it's exciting watching you as you've taken your experiences of your life, which have not always been easy, and you've put it together in a way, in a very creative way, that is changing other people's lives. I, I just, I applaud those efforts. That's really a beautiful story. I mean, even the one story about the gentleman you mentioned, uh, sometimes people get so scared and so hopeless and so overwhelmed. And to think that you touched his life so much that you actually changed his life and you changed the life of 
all of the people that love him and all the people he was going to meet in the future. I mean, bravo, bravo. And bravo Thank for you. having the courage to do this. So well, honest, honestly, cool. like I thank thank you very much. But the I have to say that the the fact is in that moment I didn't I had no idea what he was going through. So it wasn't it wasn't like I thought oh I'm gonna help this guy. Right. And that was that was partly what I wanted to do the show about kindness was that nobody really knows like nobody knows um, the, the times like there have been moments in the show that I. I've mentioned somebody else being unexpectedly come to me and they had no idea how difficult a day I was having. We never know what what the, no. pe the battles are that other people are fighting. Right. Especially, it seems like it's, it's more intense than ever before. I know, um, of course, in the UK, we're dealing with all the Brexit stuff and in the United States, we're dealing with some uh, very interesting things at a leadership level of the United States. <laughs> to say the least. And it, it's, it is extremely stressful. And we see suicides in the U.S. with our children. It, it, it's, it, suicide is the number one cause of death now of Americans between the age, I, I believe, somebody said 14 to 18 or 13 to 17. But that is a tragic thing to say. That is horrible. And we're seeing kids 9 to 11 committing suicide. What? It's horrible. So, we need work like you're doing, work like we're doing to really change and say, no, no, it, it, hold on, hold on. I, I, I think it's really important that to focus on uh, unity and uniting people because we're always going to have differences. There's no two people yes. are going to have exactly the same opinion about everything. But when you're in a room full of people who are laughing at a comedy gig, then everyone is united at least in that one moment in we're all laughing at this this joke, at the butt right. of whatever this joke is. And um, for me, like that's the most important thing. I don't, I don't want division. I've had enough division in my own psyche, uh, let alone in my actual life. So I want to unite people um, as much as I possibly can, um, and also to empower them because I think in today's society, I know I feel fairly powerless a lot of the time. Um, so being able to remind people, no, you actually have a hell of a lot of power. You just, we, we often feel overwhelmed by all of the things that are going on worldwide, globally, um, existentially, if we just focus on what we can change today, whether that be just being a little bit kinder to each other or whether that's yeah. turning around and seeing a brand new friend next to you rather than a stranger, then those those are things that can have real huge change if you just focus on each individual positive action. And I also think that we have to have the courage to talk about these things. I remember when my husband was diagnosed with dementia. At first, I didn't talk about it because I I didn't want to dishonor him by talking about it. And then I thought, how can you not talk about And And I actually talked to him about it, even though um, a very common thing he says to me is, now, he says this to me all the time. And I used to correct him, I don't anymore. He'll say, well, I didn't know that. I never saw, uh, we were watching, we were playing a game yesterday where we were, um, they would give us a clip of a movie and you would guess something about it, seen it. And my husband kept saying, I never saw that movie, which he did. I never saw that. And instead of saying, yes, you did, don't you? I, I just say, I know, well, you know what? You should watch it because it's really a funny movie. But where I find I can truly connect with him as we walk this pretty scary journey is through comedy and through music. Those are the two arts, comedy, music. That's where uh, he's still there. He's My husband has a real smart Alex sense of humor. So does Neil, by the way. Um, <laughs> so I appreciate that humor. Antonio's got a good sense of humor too, but humor connects us and being kind. I tell my daughter that all the time with Down syndrome. It's like being kind is just one it's a gift you can give to people because you don't know what people are walking and then having the courage to talk about your journey especially when it's been really hard your journey sounds really hard it sounds hard i and have a lot to be grateful for though a hell of a lot and gratitude has, has also been a big big help for me um getting me through but you're so right about like being brave enough to um to offer up information like sometimes it's brave enough to ask questions but sometimes people are too scared to ask questions and don't want to upset uh, pe people so sometimes it's actually empowering to offer up a bit of information um without being asked um although unsolicited information is also not it's a it's a balance we found uh but luckily for me with with the comedy shows if you get up on stage for an hour then pe people are kind of giving you permission to talk for an hour <laughs>
Yeah, no, I, I think um, absolute, and it's, it is it is a release for the audience as much as it is for for the performer. Uh, I just want to revisit the, what you were saying about your your Twitter family and your social media family. We've all found that the, the, the community does really come together and support people. There's a lot of stuff out there where people are saying, oh, social media is terrible, you know, there's all of these awful things happening. But there's also a really positive side and people do care and people do want to reach out, they do want to be kind. and. And, and, and when you give of yourself and you talk about your own vulnerabilities, actually people will come and, and, and the support that's out there is really impressive. I've, I've noticed just how much people do want to help and do want to um, be part of making the world a better place. So I, I, I'm, I'm a believer. Um, I think thank I you so think much. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much for, for sharing your time and your, your experience and, and uh, uh, all of the stuff that you're doing with us today. Uh, I'm sure that the, the new show is going to be a great success. I'm looking forward to seeing the, the new material. I need to thank um, Barclays, Microlink and MyClearText for helping us keep the lights on and, and doing what we do and keeping accessible. Um, looking forward to uh, chatting with you on, on Twitter on Tuesday as well. Thank I you so you much. Thank you very much. It's yes. been wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We love your work. We love your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ditto to you.